Hey, what's up, everybody? This is your boy Kenny, and this is Oprah's Masterclass Season 6, and this episode is about the living legend herself, Gladys Knight. I am a huge fan of Gladys Knight. Um, just a few days ago, I was listening to um, I Feel a Song in My Heart. I love that track, and because um, um, they did like a remake of it on um, Star, which is a which is um, a show on um, on Fox, and it's coming back next Thursday, and I will be reviewing that show, by the way. But yeah, <laughs> I'm a huge fan of Gladys Knight. Um, definitely, she's definitely um, a voice that I've that I definitely listen to, and um, I definitely love her vocal style, I love her vocal ability, and I love her humility as a human being. She's a very special woman, and I definitely love watching her on Apollo. I've been waiting on you. <laughs> yeah, it's just a sweetheart, a true sweetheart. Then, um, but her master class was very good, um, so um, let me get into it. Um, pretty much the first point she makes is, and this was very, very very profound is um, love everybody even if they're not nice talk about a Christian principle like no other love everybody even when the, even if they're not nice because it's so easy to hate but it's hard to love and I thought that was very very interesting and she and she brings up this point that um, you know that goes and I'm um, in she makes this point, you know, in reference to at the age of seven, she was on this um, show called the Ted Mack um, Amateur Hour. And that show was like American Idol or The Voice today. You know, it was that kind of show where people can come on the show and actually display their talents and they were awarded, you know, a prize if they won. And she went on, you know, the show at the age of seven. And at the time, you know, segregation was rampant. Um, it was it was a tough time for for blacks in America, and and she pretty and pretty much um, she was she said that she was blessed because she grew up in a family that you know that taught her to learn that taught her how to not only learn to survive but to not have hate in their heart. And she says her mother. Her mother raised her not to see color, but to see the human being and to see their character. And I can say that I can relate to Gladys on that because I was also raised the same way. And um, she talks about uh, appearing on, you know, the Ted Mack Amateur Hour, and she actually won first place. And, uh, the, she, and she said the trophy was bigger than she was because she was a little girl. and But it was this really big trophy. And... Um, since she couldn't hold the trophy herself, Ted Macca had the idea that, look, all you other contestants, won't you all stand in the picture with her and help her hold this trophy up? And the parents was like, absolutely not, you know, due to the fact that she was a black girl. And, you know, she said at a time when she was seven years old, she didn't think nothing of it because she really didn't understand racism at that time. Um... But she said that the, the, the host, Ted Mack, he was very kind to her. He, you know, was very nice to her. And he was the one that stood with her and held up that award. Because she won it. And she won it because she, she was a child prodigy. I mean, that great voice that we hear today was just as powerful as it was then at the age of seven. And it just goes to show you, look at God. And just look how our gifts can can really manifest great things for, for not only for us but even for the people that, that listen to us. So I thought that, that was that was beautiful. But um but then um but um but she pretty much said she didn't teach us color but she taught I mean as far as her mother. She said my mother didn't teach us color but she taught us circumstances. She let us know that this is the circumstances that we're in but you know, they're gonna, there's going to be a better day. Um, and she says that, look, um, she pretty much says, she pretty much also states in this segment, too, that she's like, I know who I am. You know, and, and she says that, look, your spirit has to be strong enough to stand even when others are trying to pull you in the wrong direction. 
And she said that even though people were mean and that people didn't have, you know, great intentions towards her, she she never she never had hatred in her heart for that person. If anything, she she said in this in the saying that look, you gotta love people because people need love. You know, even the most negative person, you know, possibly is that way because of lack of love and the lack of respect. And she says that that's why, you know, she holds that mantra that love everybody, even if they're not nice. So I thought that was, that was, that was, that was very powerful. Another point um, she makes is make the most of what you've got. And she talks about that, you know, her family was poor. But they made the best of what they got. She said she came she came from a very strong, close knit family where they all encouraged each other. They all, you know, they all they all came together and they helped um, helped helped you to realize your dreams, your full potential. They they were there as your biggest support and your biggest cheerleaders. And she even talks about. Um, you know, when when she was a little girl, um, they wanted she wanted to throw a birthday party for her big brother Bubba, and you know they didn't have any money, but uh, they bought bologna sandwiches, and they, and she said she had a friend named Garfield who had a record player, so they pretty much you know decided to throw a little party for Bubba, and they they had the bologna sandwiches and was dancing and and dancing to. Um, Garfield's record player, but then Garfield got mad because they was going to play an album that he didn't want to hear, so Garfield was like, well, if you're not going to play what I want, then I'm going to take my record player back, so Gladys was like, okay, you can take your record player back, so <laughs> they turned, so therefore, so after um, Garfield took his record player back, they they decided amongst themselves that, hey, we're just going to have a talent show, so the family, you know, her, her cousins, her her siblings, they started singing and started, you know, putting on shows. And um, her mother, you know, wa you know, was witnessing this and saw the talent that she saw in these youngsters. And she was saying that, you know, do you really want? And so she came to to them and asked them, do you really want to do this? Do you guys really want to make a? You guys really want to make um, make something out of this? And they and they said yes. Yeah. And and what she ends up doing is that she calls Pip. You know, Pip was um, her was was Gladys's cousin, um, her mother's nephew, and Pip was pretty much known, you know, you know, in the circles. You know, he was a manager, and you know, she pretty much told Pip that, look, I need you to get, you know, find some engagements for these kids, and. <laughs> and he was like, <laughs> and he was like, now I want to deal with them, too. <laughs> and she's like, uh, you're going to deal with these children. And once he actually heard them, he immediately was like, he got something here. So he started promoting them throughout the city. And they ended up playing for the Royal Peacock, which was like one of the top spots in Atlanta at the time. And it was from, it was from that that they they came up with the name, you know, because they, they, they said that they didn't care, you know, they were just calling themselves anything. Like, they were like the Knight family, but they said, like, the Knight family really doesn't click. So, you know, we need a name. So what should we call ourselves? And they named themselves after her cousin Pip. And that's where Gladys Knight and the Pips came from. And I was like, wow. <laughs> All this time I had no idea. So I thought that was that was really awesome that they named themselves after after their manager. Another um, a point she makes, which I thought was a very special point, was get back on the horse. And they talk, she talks about doing this show, and I think uh, Dinah Washington was on the bill. And she said that Dinah Washington was gruff. You know, she was just out there. You know, she was cutting out her musicians. She was a woman that said what she meant and meant what she said. She was just that type of woman. But she said that she admired her. And uh, they were pretty much, um, you know, doing some of the... They were, and she said that they did shows where they were performing with the platters, you know, and some of the big acts of that time. They were, like, on the same bill. They were just known as the Pips then. And uh, um, 
she talks about um, on on the show that she that she did with Dinah Washington. Uh, you know, they 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 didn't have a dressing room, so they had like these sheets that were put up, and they would change behind the sheets. So she said what she would do is that she would dress from the head down, and you know she would stop on the top and just work her way down. Well, she said that they they went on stage after they had a costume change to do their show, and while she was on stage, her slip fell off during her performance, and people and like Pip is kind of looking at her like. And she didn't realize what was going on until she looked down and saw that her slip was coming off. So she pretty much, um, pretty much ran off stage and, you know, went to go. And she said she broke down crying because she, she said that was like one of the most embarrassing moments of her career. You know, your slip falling on stage, I mean, that's, <laughs> that can definitely, you know, that can definitely, you know, send some shock value if you, if you really ask me. But... She she went back and you know Pip had found her and Pip was like okay you okay you know you finally got your sweat back on now get back out there and she's like I'm not going back out there he's like oh you are going back out there and she said they went back and forth she said she cried he's like look you are going to get back out there you're not going to do this to me you're going to get back out there and you're going to do your show and she went out there and did a show despite how embarrassed she was she still did what she had to do. And she said that, um, and she said that after they did that show, Dinah Washington wanted them to go on tour with them. So even in a most horrible situation, something good came out of it. You know, they ended up going going on tour with Dinah Washington. And in that point, she she um, she stresses that look when when life knocks you down, get back up. You know, show business is not that much different from life. You know. Just like in show business, just like in life, you have to get back on that horse when you fall off. Very powerful. Um, another point she um, she stresses in this um, in this episode is opportunities are bald headed. I never heard that before, but I thought that was that was that was interesting. And she says she learned early on that the industry is a very doggy dog business, and. She uses the example that um, there was this guy who had a studio, and, you know, he wanted to kind of try out some of the, you know, some of the, you know, some all of the, you know, technical, <coughs> excuse me, all of the technical devices that came with the studio. So he wanted to see how things would sound. So he gets them to go in there and start recording. So they start recording some, you know, cover songs and stuff, but then he asked them, do you have any original material? So they they pretty, they pretty much recorded the song um, with every beat of my heart, and what ended up happening was that they ended up hearing the song on the radio, and they had no entitlements to the song whatsoever because the song was actually sold the the actual masters of it was sold to Fury Records, and. You know, this guy literally stole their song and made a profit off of it and didn't cut them anything. And uh, so, um, so pretty much, you know, later on, I think it was in 1960, uh, she was at high school. You know, she was um, on the track team. She said her brother and her two cousins, who are part of the Pips, they pretty much ran to her and told her that, look, you know, we got to go home. Mama wants you home because we got to fly to New York tonight. And she's like, I'm not flying to New York tonight. tonight. Well, I'm not flying to New York tonight. We got to trap me. And she was like, and, she, and they was like, girl, if you don't get your butt on, like, Mama wants you home now. We got to go. So they all went home. And what ended up happening is that they had to go to New York because Fury Records wanted to sign them. And... Pretty much, you know, it was from that situation, you know, as much as Gladys at, at the time didn't want to go to New York, she kind of let her mother let her know that, look, opportunities are ball headed and you have to grab on to them before they slip through your fingers. I was like, man, can you think of anything more wise than that? That was awesome. Like, that is just sheer wisdom. And... 
and what happened was that they ended up going to um, New York. They got signed to Fury Records, and they re-released, you know, the song, um, you know, with every beat of my heart. And they would then build Gladys Knight in the pits. And also, um, you know, in this situation, she actually talks about, um, you know, um, you know, this was also a time where because she she was used to going. I mean, even though segregation was around her, she was they were all sheltered and protected by their close knit family and community that she grew up in. Now that she's living in New York, you know, she's now you know, she's now in a totally different world. And then when they start going on tour, especially down in the South, they started to see the real ugly side of racism. And they had talked about this um, time they had stopped for gas, and she had to go to the bathroom. She went in and asked if she used the bathroom, and the attendant told her that, you know, niggas ain't allowed to use our bathrooms. And she began to flip, the, the, she began to flip out on the attendant, who was a white guy. And she said her, her family literally came in and literally pulled her out of there because I'm like, girl, you're going to get us killed. What are you doing? And she was saying that, you know, but I'm, but I'm saying we just gave this man money for gas and we can't use his bathroom. What sense does that make? And he says that, yeah, you're right. But at the end of the day, the way you're going about it, it it's, it's just it's, it's not going to work out because, you know, they could kill us all. But she was saying that this was the first time at the age of 13 that she witnessed racism to her face. And at that moment, she flipped out. But, but at that moment, she realized that, hey, she had to um, pull herself together and, and actually realize that, look, you know, this is, this is a bigger fight. And, you know, I'm not going to let that situation burden me, and I'm not going to let that situation um, stop me from seeing the light. So, she was she was very, very remarkable in her points in this episode, and definitely, I'm, um, I would say that point was, was definitely very powerful. And another point she makes in this segment is, be the best example you can be. And she says that, you know, not only does she did she actually take this, you know, seriously with her children, but she also takes this, you know, with her family, her friends, and everybody who meets her. Um, they actually talk, she also brings up another situation where she was faced with segregation. Um, they were, because she said that her and other acts, you know, who were kind of like on the children's circuit at the time, they would do motorcades together where they'd be like five or six in a car, and they would just be traveling you know, along the road to go from gig to gig. And she said one time, you know, they were pulled over by the police, and the police pretty much told them that they ain't going nowhere, and, and for them to get in their car and follow them, they take them all the way back into the woods to this house, and then this house had cells. So they, and they locked all the men up, and they were there all day. And finally, they told them they get one phone call, they called Motown, and Motown said something to them, and they were released. And they also, she also talks about at this time, you know, they had to, they had to sing and split audiences, like the white, like the white audience would be in the auditorium, and then like, you know, down in the gymnasium, you know, which would be like a, like somewhere like a sock hop, and there were no chairs. Is where the the um, the black audience would be. And she said that she hated that, but then again, you know that's what that's what it was at those times. And and uh, she she had talked about she had also talked about you know while performing in Greensboro, you know Greensboro, North Carolina, that is. Um, she had said that um, they had finished their show. The girls went on the bus while the men broke down, you know, the stage. While they were on the bus, this white guy came in. He came on the bus and was like, "What y'all niggas think y'all doing?" And they, they and like the women let them let the guys know, like, "Look, you guys better be off the bus by the time those men come up. The time the, the time um, our men get up here." So they got off the bus, and then as soon as they um, as soon as they were getting off the bus, the men came up and 
the guys were still outside, the white guys. And they let they let the um the fellas know what happened. The fellas go outside and actually chase them and while the guy, the, the the white guys are running away, somebody shot a gun. And she said that, you know, she began to understand racism more and even going back to that to that situation she had with the attendant, she really started to understand that this was something that was ingrained. It wasn't just like one incident or one situation. This was like a standard practice of life. And that black people had it extremely hard during that time. But she said that, you know, despite the hate and despite the um, the nastiness that she received, um, she says that you have to connect despite the bad that's thrown at you, and that you and that you should pray for those who are lost, not hate them. And another point she makes in this episode is love and respect yourself first. Um, and she said this is this is lessons that she got from an early age from her parents, and she said that. Um, you know, regardless of me being successful, at the end of the day, I'm still a normal person. And she says that, look, I watch my manners, I respect people, you know, I set that example for my children, you know, and I also do that with my audience, you know. And she says it's important to respect yourself because you can't ask for respect if you're not giving it. So, yeah, you can't ask for something that you're not giving. So she said that you respect yourself people will respect you because they see that you respect yourself and you respect how the way you deliver yourself and how you present yourself. So so she pretty much said that she learned from an early age respect people in general. And then um, another point she stresses in this episode is put your faith in yourself. You know, and she talks about their stint at Motown Records. And she says that look, we were not born at Motown because we had had a we had had been at different labels before we had got to Motown. And she said that, you know, her issue with um, Motown was that they weren't high on the roster as far as the business side. She said as far as the collective and creative side, she loved that about Motown. You know, the the actual camaraderie and and um, and friendships that she developed. She liked that aspect of it, but she hated the business of Motown because the business was due to the, was due to the fact that they, weren't, that they weren't on the top of their roster, so they weren't given the same type of promotion that some other artists were getting. And then she also said that, you know, also being a female, she definitely wasn't given that much of um, a promotion or say-so in the business side of things. So they, they amongst themselves said that, look, if we're dealt, this is the deal we're dealt with, let's go about making ourselves great entertainers. Let's be great performers because that is where we're going to establish our business. And lo and behold, they were right because they, they pretty much were, were you know, they, they were known as being very great performers. I mean, Gladys Knight and the Pips, you know, they were selling out shows all the time, you know. And she says it was from that that they were able to keep going, and eventually they moved on from Motown. And another point she stresses in this episode is wait till it clicks. And in this, she talks about, you know, her, um, you know, her, her marriage with her husband, and that she's been, she's been married four times, and the first time, she, her first marriage was when she was 16. And she was saying that, yeah, and like, um, even though she's had greatness in her career, she hasn't really been successful with love until now. And she says she has a covenant with her husband. And she said that's something she never had in any of her marriages. You know, she wasn't just, you know, getting married so, they, so that they can, so, they, so that, you know, they can have, you know, you know, sex. <laughs> you know, she now realizes and understands, you know, the importance of marriage and how to make a marriage work. And and she says that her marriage now, and she said that, you know, she knew him for years and that they had been friends and finally they're in this new place in their, in their friendship when they're now lovers and now man and wife. And 
and she said that, you know, it's an ongoing progression with their relationship. And and pretty much uh she talks about, you know, she she now has seventeen grandkids and she says that he's like a child magnet, her husband. You know, children just flock to him. And and she said that look, the same standards that I that that, that I grew up with, you know, it's about respecting yourself and respecting others, we instill those same ideas with our grandchildren. And she says that we really are partners and this time we made it click and our marriage works. So that was awesome. Another um, episode, I, I'm sorry, not another episode, forgive me. Um, another point she makes in this episode is step out, step on out there. And um, she talks about, um, in this segment, when she decided to leave the pips to become Gladys Knight, the solo artist. And she said that her and her brother, you know, they butted heads about it. But she told him that, look, at the end of the day, I have to do this for me because we've all grown as people. And, you know, there's now certain things I want to express that I won't be able to do with the tips, but I have to do on my own. And I had to do this for my children. I had to do this for me. You know, I had to put myself out there. And and she said that, yeah, her and her, her, and her brother um, had an argument, but it wasn't. Uh, but it was over the fact that, you know, they had been together for 40 years before she decided to go solo. And she said that they built a life together. You know, they built a career together. And, you know, finally she, you know, made her transition to being a solo artist. And she said that being solo was, was, was not easy because she was so used to, you know, her brother and her cousins being there. And now she was out there by herself. So it was now... She was now put in a situation where she just had to step on out there and just do it, you know, and she had to take it one day at a time, and she had to be fearless. So I thought that was awesome. And then another, the last point she makes in this episode is say something. She was, and this was about her connecting with her audience, because normally she would just be like, thank you, but wouldn't, wouldn't, but wouldn't actually have a dialogue or connection with the people that she was performing in front of. And I, I now, as, um, you know, as an aspiring artist myself, I see the importance of that because you want to connect with the people that are supporting you. You want to be able to talk to them and share some of your personal things that you're going through because as an artist, you know, it's artistic expression. You know, you're not only singing something that may have happened to somebody that you know, but you're also singing of something that may have happened to you. So you want to have that connection with your audience. Your audience wants to feel that they can, you know, they can, you know, open up and connect with you. So she learned that, you know, you know, from that, that, um, yeah, say something, you know, because you never know what you say can uplift someone or yet, Due to the fact that you connect with someone in the audience, they do something that actually helps up. That they do something or say something to you that actually uplifts you. So we're all in this together. We're all benefiting from this. So she, so she pretty much has the ideals that look. Everyone can be prosperous. Everybody has gifts. Everyone can. Everyone has an opportunity to achieve greatness. And that if we actually uplifted each other the world would be a better place. And I completely agree with you, Gladys, because I share that same sentiment. I'm always about uplifting and helping others. You know, I'm never about tearing somebody down or whipping someone down because there's nothing to gain from that. It's only loss. There's only gain from positivity and, you know, and, uh, you know, being there for people and showing them the right way. So that's what I have, guys. Um, if I missed anything, put it down in the comments. Or if you have any ideas you would like to share, put it down there. I would love to connect with you. But uh, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe to my channel. Click that bell so you get notifications every time I drop a video. I also have a GoFundMe link that's down in the description box. Definitely check that out when you get a chance. But also like this video, comment on this video, share this video. And I will be back with the next episode of um, Oprah's Masterclass. So until then, everybody. Take care.